Hello, and thank you for joining me. My name is Dr. Elizabeth Reinald, and I'll get right into my presentation, but I wanted to give you a chance to see who is going to be talking with the slides today. Today, I'm going to be talking about preventing dementia, and I'm going to frame it as a user's manual for your brain. I'm at a bit of risk of taking this comparison too far, but as I was putting the presentation together, I actually found it sort of fit. This presentation is based on the updated Lancet Commission report, Dementia Prevention, Intervention and Care, released in 2020. And to sum it all up, it really outlines the importance of regu regular scheduled maintenance for your brain. Through this presentation, I have gotten permission from my family to put in some pictures from our attendance of car shows throughout the region. And as I said, there are a lot of comparisons that fit. If you want your ride to look this good years from now, there are some things you need to be doing right from the day you get your brain. So the report summarized 12 domains with evidence supporting things we can do to prevent dementia. And I'm going to describe how the targets of dementia prevention are different throughout the lifespan. For some background information, The Lancet is a UK medical journal and they partnered with charitable and academic organizations, including the Alzheimer's Society in the UK and University College London. And the commission was led by Dr. Jill Livingston. There were international participants, which did include the quite famous Canadian geriatrician, Dr. Ken Rockwood, out of Dalhousie University in Halifax. And Dr. Livingston actually presented at the 10th Canadian Conference on Dementia in 2019, which I was able to attend and we got a sneak peek of the 2020 report. This was actually an updated report and an initial report was released in 2017. That initial report had 665 references and this updated report published in 2020 added 315 references with new material since that original report. So this is the take home summary, which the Lancet Commission released as a life course model of 12 different modifiable risk factors that may prevent or delay, if added together, up to 40% of dementia. That does mean that 60% of dementia is from things that are out of our control and includes genetic predispositions and other medical factors. But they describe these different modifiable risk factors as having different attributable risk, which I'll be clarifying as we go through. And attributable risk is the amount of risk of that 40% that can be laid at the feet of each of these different risk factors. The attributable risk gives an indication of how strong that risk factor is multiplied by how common that risk factor is in the population. So a risk factor that is very strong but rare might have the same attributable risk as a risk factor that has a lower risk but is very common in the population. And this life course model summarizes the times to focus on the different risk factors. They're very clear that many of them are important at a number of points through our lifespan, but some of them have more evidence that we can modify that risk factor in certain periods of our life. They also emphasize that some of the risk factors cluster together, so changes in one may impact other risk factors. And they also found that risk factors often cluster around inequalities. Just because this was a question that I was immediately wondering, I wondered what they meant by early life, midlife, and later life. 
and they considered midlife to be between 45 and 65 years of age, with early life being 18 and younger, and later life being 65 years of age and older. So here are the 12 modifiable risk factors. They're a bit small in this graphic, but we'll go through it in more detail. It includes less education, hearing impairment, traumatic brain injury, hypertension or high blood pressure, high alcohol consumption, obesity, smoking, depression, social isolation, physical inactivity, air pollution, and diabetes. And there's an asterisk by three of these risk factors. These are three risk factors that were added in the 2020 report because there was enough evidence to show that these were modifiable risk factors. So I'm going to go through the risk factors one by one, and we're gonna start with the risk factor that needs to be addressed in early life, so late, late uh, sorry, earlier than 18 years of age. And I put in this picture of this very spiffy brand new race car to say, really, you have to start planning for the maintenance of this vehicle if you want it to look like a collector's item 85 years from now. For our brain, the biggest modifiable risk factor in this age group is avoiding less education. And this is a priority in early life because cognitive ability plateaus in the late teens with little gains after your 20s. That doesn't mean you don't accumulate new knowledge, but as far as cognitive, what you can do with your brain, that plateaus after your 20s. So the priority in early life is cognitive stimulation. And then that accounts for 7% of population attributable risk. That's the level of education achieved is what they've been able to study in research studies. Higher childhood education in addition to lifelong education has evidence for reducing dementia risk. The report also highlights evidence that in mid and late life, the priority shifts to maintaining cognition. People in their 30s to 60s who travel, go on social outings, outings play music, create art, are physically active, reading and speaking a second language, all maintain their cognition better than people who did not. And people 65 years of age and older who read play games and bet had reduced risk of dementia, meaning that they used their brain as much as possible. Now we're going to shift to midlife risk factors. And these are the risk factors that have evidence that we should be focusing on trying to modify our risk in our years 45 to 65. So in Midlife, hearing loss actually has the highest attributable risk at 8%, and that's the highest attributable risk of all 12 of the risk factors. This seems to have a dose response where an, there's an increasing risk of dementia for every 10 decibels of worsening hearing loss. And the good news is, is that hearing aid use is protective. All of the studies show that there's increased risk of death, uh, dementia, except in those using hearing aids. And there's less deterioration when they go looking after initiation of hearing aids. But this does need to be an early intervention. So the important thing is to avoid losing the cognitive abilities early and in midlife, rather than waiting too late. So there's evidence that hearing aids can reverse the sensory deprivation that people with impaired hearing experience, but they have to correct that hearing as soon as possible. And it's also true that hearing aids are better tolerated if they're initiated early. So by the time people have dementia, often they are unable to filter out the background noise from hearing aids, and they may not 
be able to get the most out of those hearing aids. It's also important to avoid traumatic brain injury. This in midlife is thought to contribute 3% of population attributable risk. Traumatic brain injuries are described as mild, where there's a concussion, and severe, where there's further damage like skull fracture, brain swelling, and a brain bleed. And they specifically highlighted some of the more common causes of traumatic brain injury to include car, motorcycle, and bicycle injuries, military exposure, boxing, horse riding, and other recreational sports, firearms, and falls. The highest risk of developing dementia is within six months of a traumatic brain injury and also the more severe the head injury. But even if they exclude people who had traumatic brain injury in the two years before they developed dementia, in case the dementia might have increased their risk of having a traumatic brain injury, they still find that risk goes up with a traumatic brain injury, though maybe this risk decreases after about 30 years after the injury. The risk of dementia increases with the number of injuries that happen at the time of the traumatic brain injury, and multiple traumatic brain injuries increases the risk of dementia compared to just one. This is why helmets have become such a priority in any um, sports or activities like workplaces where there's the risk of a traumatic brain injury. The report says there still needs to be more research into chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which happens in sports where there's repeated head trauma. Hypertension or high blood pressure is a modifiable risk factor, and they state that this is one to target for good control in midlife. This is because this is the time at which you're able to tolerate the medications for high blood pressure, but also this can prevent some of the vascular brain changes. And we can already see that some of the predictions that were made 20 or 30 years ago about the number of people who should now have dementia is less than expected, probably because of good vascular risk factor control in the last decades. Hypertension is described as a 2% population attributable fraction. And when they're talking about high blood pressure, they're talking about elevated systolic blood pressure above 140 millimeters of mercury. That's the top number when blood pressure is reported. The risk increases if the blood pressure is high for a long time. And there's the risk of dementia even if there's no other signs of cardiovascular disease like heart attack or heart failure. It appears that in the studies treating hypertension with medications, there is a decrease in the risk of dementia, which is good news. So far, no single medication has been found to be better than others for preventing dementia. It's important to note that as people become frailer, the risk of overtreating hypertension goes up. And this is why this risk factor is targeted to midlife, because this is the time when you can do the most to protect the brain and also tolerate the antihypertensive treatments. Alcohol is a known risk factor for dementia. This is a priority in midlife with a 1% population attributable fraction. Heavy alcohol use or alcohol misuse disorder is clearly associated with an increased risk of dementia, especially early onset dementia, which is dementia that starts at an age less than 65 years. But the report summarizes that drinking 21 units of alcohol per week, or an average of three a day, was associated with an increased risk of dementia compared to people who drink less than 14 units. 
And even at 12 units per week, reaction time declined more in those who drank 12 units or more a week. There were MRI changes compared to people drinking less for people who drank 14 units or more. Obesity has been a, uh, described as a risk factor for dementia. And again, to get the most out of weight loss, this is a priority in midlife, as well as being important for other health conditions. This has a 1% population attributable fraction of risk for dementia. There was a review of 19 studies with over half a million people aged 35 to 65 years followed for 42 years, and they found that obesity with a body mass index of 30 or more was associated with late life dementia, but not being overweight or no normal weight. And a body mass index is your weight in kilograms divided by your height in meters squared. Again, giving us some optimism that this is a modifiable risk factor, weight loss of two kilograms or more in people with a body mass index of 25 or more was associated with a sig significant improvement in attention and memory. In this study, the average age of the participants was 50. Now I'm going to shift to the risk factors that were targeted for interventions in later life or 65 years of age or older. And these are more my style of collector vehicles, not that I own one myself, but you really have to have done some work to keep these rides looking this good many years later. But there are things that can be done for these vintage vehicles to keep them in good running order. Smoking is an important health priority throughout life, but there is evidence to show that modifying this risk factor in late life can have benefits with a 5% population attributable risk fraction. Smokers that are, are at higher risk of dementia over and above their risk of premature death before the age they might develop dementia. But the good news is stopping smoking, even after 60 years of age, substantially decreased the risk of developing dementia over eight years of follow-up. And this benefit was seen after just four years of non-smoking status. There's also one study that was summarized that showed that women exposed to secondhand smoke was associated with more memory deterioration, possibly another modifiable risk factor if people can decrease their exposure to secondhand smoke. Depression is summarized in the late life modifiable risk factors with a 4% population attributable fraction. Depression is complicated because it is a risk factor, but it can also be an early symptom of brain changes that will progress to dementia. Late life depression has stronger evidence as a risk factor for dementia than depression in early life. It's not yet clear if treating depressive symptoms with antidepressants decreases future dementia risk. Social isolation is a known risk factor, and we've certainly been talking about it more in the last year and a half through the COVID pandemic. This is an important risk factor in late life with a 4% population attributable risk. There have been a number of different approaches to assessing people's social connectedness, and all of them find that social contact is a protective factor, and we need to work even harder during the COVID pandemic to safely try to maintain those social contacts. So just to summarize some of the social connectedness, 
I included this list from a Japanese study that used a five point scale for measuring social connectedness. And it didn't matter which in particular kind of social connectedness you had, but the more con of these connectedness points you got, the lower the risk of dementia was. So this included marital status, but also included exchanging support with family members, which can either mean receiving or giving support, having contact with friends, participating in community groups, and engaging in paid work. So some of us have more control over these er some of these areas than others, but they can all potentially have benefits to increasing our social connections. Physical activity, inactivity is a known risk factor for many health conditions and is a priority for preventing dementia in late life as well as in early and midlife. And this is one of those risk factors that's very interconnected because increasing your physical activity can decrease your blood pressure and if you're exercising with other people, can increase your social connections. Specific to dementia, it has a 2% population attributable fraction of risk. They summarize that studies of one to 21 years duration show exercise is associated with a reduced risk of dementia. And this included a decreased risk in clinically diagnosed Alzheimer's disease one of the specific types of dementia. They stated that exercise might be required to be sustained and continued nearer the time of risk of developing dementia, suggesting that we can't just priority, prioritize exercise for late life. It really needs to be more sustained, but that there is still benefit of exercising at the time when the risk of developing symptom of dementia increases. And it's pretty consistent that for the purpose of decreasing dementia risk, aerobic exercise is better than exercise where you don't get your heart rate up as much. So exercise where you are sweating, and it's hard to speak in full sentences should be the priority. Although there may be other health benefits like falls risk reduction with exercise that does not get your heart rate pumping as much. And it's actually encouraging to know that there's evidence that there is improvement in cognitive function for people with mild cognitive impairment who exercise. These are people who are experiencing some symptoms of memory impairment or other changes in their thinking, but they continue to be functionally independent, so they don't have dementia, but maybe prioritizing exercise in this group can help to delay or decrease the development of dementia. Air pollution was added in the 2020 report. It's targeted as a late life risk factor for modification with a 2% population attributable fraction. This is probably one where society has a big responsibility for helping everybody modify this risk factor. And they suspect that the biologic mechanism may be similar to smoking, just on a much bigger scale. The pollutants that are associated with dementia include high nitrogen dioxide concentration, which is often produced by traffic, fine ambient particular particulate matter from traffic exhaust, and particulate matter from residential wood burning. In one US study, the burden of dementia from particulate matter was particularly high in Black or African American individuals and those who were socioeconomically disadvantaged uh, in socially economically disadvantaged communities as an example of the ways in which social inequities can cause an increased risk that is not fairly distributed through, throughout all of our communities. 
diabetes is a risk factor for developing dementia. And the report targeted it for late life focus as a modifiable risk factor with a 1% population attributable fraction. The risk of dementia increases with the duration of diabetes and the severity of diabetes. The good news is, is that there is evidence that safely controlling blood sugars for diabetics does help to decrease the risk of dementia because that will decrease the severity of their diabetes that is usually described by how high the blood sugars are. But there isn't evidence to support one particular medication over another in the control of diabetes. Diabetes clusters with other cardiovascular risk factors. So it is likely just one part of controlling the risk profile to decrease the risk of dementia. One of the cardiovascular risk profiles described included smoking, diet, physical activity, body mass index, which was that measurement of your weight based on your height, fasting glucose, which is a marker of how your diabetes control is, cholesterol, and blood pressure. The better those factors are, the lower the risk of dementia. They mentioned a couple of risk factors that just didn't have enough evidence at this time to make a solid recommendation about how much they may be contributing to our risk of dementia. One of the risk factors was diet. In the studies, there are mixed results. Probably the protection from diet comes from decreasing the cardiovascular risk factors we were just talking about. Overall, there's a shift from making recommendations about individual nutrients to focusing on the whole diet or the whole foods rather than breaking them down into their component vit vitamins and nutrients. The WHO recommends the Mediterranean diet specifically as it might help and does not harm and is known to be helpful for other health conditions. And the Mediterranean diet is described as a high intake of vegetables, legumes, fruits, nuts, cereals, olive oil with low saturated lipids and meats. Sleep is another potential risk factor and their studies show that there's a U-shaped association between sleep, the hours you sleep, and the risk of dementia. There's a higher risk of dementia both with less than five hours of sleep a night and with 10 or more hours of sleep at night compared to people who slept five to seven hours a night. But the tricky thing right now is that we don't have evidence that there's a way to modify the number of hours we sleep safely because there is very solid and consistent evidence that taking sleeping pills does not help a person develop normal or healthy sleep and in fact, sleeping pills can increase the risk of dementia. So all of us have different lifestyles and priorities out of this list of 12, but all of us have something that we can do to decrease our future risk of dementia. I think that this life course model really emphasizes that brain maintenance is a lifelong priority and these pictures sort of sum it up. You don't want to wait until the wheels fall off. You want to do what you can as soon as possible throughout your life. There is evidence to support making changes for each of these 12 risk factors. And there may be, there will be more evidence to come, probably identifying other risk factors we can do something about. These reports are only based on what studies have been done and new studies are always coming out. Each of us can look at which risk factors would be the most significant for us as individuals and then use that as a guide for setting goals and challenging ourselves to make realistic changes in our routines 
that benefit brain health and have other health benefits. So thank you very much for listening to this summary. If you'd like to access a copy of the Lancet Commission report, it's available open access online and you can search for Lancet Commission Dementia Prevention. You're looking for the 2020 report if you want the one that summarizes all 12 risk factors. And if you want to know more about the Commission's um, start, that would be in the 2017 paper. And I did confirm with the Brandon Library outreach that um, the local public library uh, can help you get a copy of the paper if you don't have access uh, online at home, and you can ask your local librarian for assistance. If you have further questions, uh, please feel free to contact Vanessa Hamilton, who is one of the Prairie Mountain Health Healthy Living Facilitators with the Health Promotion uh, Program here in PMH, and I've included her phone number and email. So I'm just going to go out of my presentation, hopefully here, so that I can say thank you very much for listening, and I hope that it's helped you identify something that you can do uh, that may decrease your future risk of dementia. Have a great rest of your day.